Welcome to the Elevate Everyday Podcast. I'm your host, Cade Junkerth. I own Fitness Junkie Training, and today I'm joined by a very educated and, and very interesting guest, Ed Dunn. <laughs> His background is in psychology. He's got a background in education and psychology, and now he's an author, speaker, podcaster, and he's all about creating and living a, a happy and fulfilling life. So very excited to get into this because I feel like this is a, a very broad topic, but I feel like you're going to have a very narrow expertise on it. So super excited. So let's dive right into it, Ed. Um, you know, what does it mean to you to live a happy life? Um, thanks for having me, by the way. Uh, super, super happy to be here. Um, so what did, what does it mean to have have a happy and fulfilling life? That's a great question, actually. Um uh, that question has a lot more depth to it than than <laughs> a lot of people might think. So, um, you know, I write about, podcast about, speak about, teach about, train about um, happiness. But the truth of it is, um, happiness is a byproduct. Um, happiness is a byproduct of of meaning and value. So, you know, however, from a marketing perspective, um, you know, if you say, yeah, I teach and write about meaning, or I teach and write about value, people are like, what? <laughs> um, but the truth of it is, um, you know, when people pursue happiness relentlessly, um, they tend to get a little bit confused and 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 they, they tend to pursue, um, they tend to engage in excessive pleasure seeking, which leads to a whole lot of problems. Right. Um, but if you, the kind of happiness that is sustained lifelong happiness, you know, look, we, we all have a natural happiness set point, right? So yeah, you can get a new car and then that new car is the greatest thing in the world for the first six months <laughs> till, right. the payment, till the payment's <laughs> set in. Um, or it's great for a year or two until the neighbor pulls in his driveway with the newer model of the same car. And then your source of happiness is now a source of, of frustration and, and right. anxiety. Um so, you know, we can pursue a lot of things that will temporarily make us happy. Um, and it's the ebb and flow, right? So so people ebb and flow. And look, you know, it's, it's not possible to be, you know, gleefully happy, you know, all day, every day. Yeah. Um, what I write about, what I teach about, what I talk about um, is about the, the kind of, of sustained life-changing happiness. And that is only the result of increasing the amount of, of value and meaning in your life. Right. If, if that makes sense. Oh, a hundred percent. I'm, I'm really yeah. glad. And I already knew this was kind of your point of view on it because we talked yeah. about it a little bit before. Sure. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm really glad that's what we're going right into because I think there is just this stigma about um, with happiness that it's like you, and I feel like it's even taught to us, most people, it's like, you know, try to be happy. And it's like, yeah. it should be, you know, try to, to cultivate value and, and cultivate meaning in your life. Right, and right. Purpose. And right. then the happiness, like you said, is the byproduct. So I'm really glad I, I, I think the same way. And I think in the past, we kind of talked about this. I was more like, you know, I want to be happy. So doing pleasure seeking things, you know, drinking even chasing women, you know, things like that. We talked about yeah. it a little bit. Um, yeah. I think people can get caught up in, in, you know, trying to just be happy, live, live their best life. But yeah. honestly, like living your best life is really being the highest value person. You can be providing the most value for others and that's going to bring you long-term happiness. Right. You, you agree with that? I, I 100% agree with that. Um, you know, look, I mean, when we're younger, um, you know, those pursuits, um, you know, <laughs> look, I was a pro at that stuff. <laughs> and, and the honest truth is, you know, a lot of us will reach a point in our lives where we go, you know, this is kind of hollow. Right. And that's not to say that, you know, as you, as young people, it doesn't have its value because at a certain age, everything's new, right? You roll into your teens and you roll into your twenties, um, you know, so many experiences are new, right? So you're just out there going, oh, wow, you know, this is this is amazing. Um, but you get to a point where you've kind of done most of that stuff. And then you kind of realize, 
you know what, um, this is all fleeting. It's a little bit hollow. And then you start trying to explore what are some ways that I can make myself sustainably happy and not just these peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. So yeah, a hundred, 100% 100 agree with you. I, I want to lean into what you're saying with the peaks and valleys, because sure. that's something I talk about with my my clients. It's just something I've realized recently where, you know, owning my own business, it's it's almost exasperated my my realization of this because right. I'll have really high highs um, and maybe get caught up in it. And then I've realized that those high highs are always followed by lows because right. I think when I let myself get too excited, you know, and, and like let that high, like kind of get to me, it leads to that low because, you know, it, cause it's almost like when one bad thing happens or, or it's like, I'm so high that it just kind of leads to that. And, yeah. and I've noticed that the vice versa is, is the case. Like, you know, when there's a low, low, usually there's, you know, I'm, I have an uptick from there. Cause it's like right. a point. So yeah. So how, how do people kind of deal with that where they can, um, you know, just realize that? Cause that's something that I've realized recently and it's right. allowed me to kind of live more stoically. And yeah. I think that, yeah. that's, that's kind of helped me. Um, so, you know, what, what's your advice for the, for that? Uh, what you just said, go read a bunch of Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, go the original stoic, right? Or at least one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, look, I, I, there is a key to that. There is a key to avoiding the, the, uh, I don't think you want to avoid the peaks so much, but you want to avoid the valleys. And there is a way to do that. And, you know, it's a it's a very Eastern concept. Um, and it is to be able to learn to accept the moment that you're well, first, it's to be present in the moment that you're in. Right. Don't spend all your time living in the past and don't spend all your time living in the future because it you can't do it anyway. Right. You know, your whole life is going to be the eternal now. Right. So be present. Um, but to the point of avoiding the lows, here's here's what it is. And this is something that takes practice. You know, this is not, you know, just the simplest thing in the world. However, it works. And that is you want to learn to accept the moment that you're in mm -hmm. without judgment, without labels. You know, we are masters at creating labels. We label everything as good or bad. You right. get up in the morning, the alarm clock goes off. You decide if that's good or bad. You know, yeah. you, you you get to the shower and you realize you don't have any shampoo. That's bad. You get to the refrigerator and go, oh, wow, I've got a fresh dozen eggs. That's good. You right. go to the bank. You're in the wrong drive through at the, the wrong line of the drive through. That's bad. Right. So we do this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a day. Yeah. And by putting labels on things and what we're doing is we are literally making a value judgment about the moment that we are in. Right. And the truth of it is. These moments are neither good nor bad, what the thinking makes them so. Right. So by really, really focusing on, hey, you know what? And, and as trite as this may sound, Kate, is, I mean, and it's <laughs> going to sound trite, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and there is so much more wisdom in that statement than people realize. Because when you can learn to accept the moments for what they are, then you take the friction out of it. Right. And, you know, we as a country, you know, in the United States, Interestingly enough, you've got the, you know, the, the freest, most affluent, most technologically advanced society in the history of the planet. And yet we managed to be collectively so unhappy that we consume not only more antidepressants than the rest of the world, we consume more antidepressants than the rest of the world combined. Right. Like 80% of the pharmaceutical antidepressant supply we eat. Right. <clears throat> and that is a direct result, I think of constantly labeling as good or bad the moment that we're in because okay. you had all kinds of unnecessary friction. Right. So here's the truth of it is, you know, I, I, I have friends, you know, who, you know, take all these, you know, these various pharmaceutical and out of presence. And look, I am not discounting that some people, um, you know, are in situations where it's a good thing, but most times I don't think that's the case. And, you know, I try to share with them, you know what you are, you know, you, you, what if you won the lottery tomorrow? Well, then I I wouldn't be taking this this stuff anymore and I'd be the happiest person on earth. And I said, well, dig this. You've already won the cosmic lottery. Yeah. The odds, the odds of you being on this planet, walking around, drawing breath, being born where you were in this country. I mean, there's not enough zeros you could put behind that number to accurately reflect just how stacked the odds are against the fact that you're walking around drawing breath and hanging out with your friends and doing what you want to do. Exactly. So I think when you come to terms that 
I don't need to wait to be happy. I've won the lottery already. And if 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 this sucks or that sucks or that, don't put that label on it. Just yes. look at it and go, you know what? It is what it is. I'm going to live in this moment and I'm going to be grateful for it. 100%. And I've seen videos where they've literally gone around and they've asked people, you know, if we gave you $10 million right now, but you didn't wake up tomorrow, like, right. would you want to get the $10 million? So literally your life, the the fact that you're alive right now, like you have to realize it's worth more than any amount of money. And it, it's, that, it's, that's a beautiful point. And I've seen that study and it, and it's outstanding. You know, it's like, yeah, you can win the lottery, but you, you, you don't, you only get to live through for the next 24 hours. Everybody be like, no. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, <laughs> Great then, point. Yeah. Great and right. your, your point on the labels, um, you know, I, I want to piggyback off that and say that like, you know, and I want to get your point on this too, but even labeling yourself compared to others, because there's so much comparison with social media and everything these days. Like, you know, it's so easy to compare yourself and put like a label on yourself. Like, Oh, well, I'm actually not doing good. I'm not doing as good as this person. Um, right. So, right. So it's, you know, do you think that's exasper exacerbated like people not being able to to feel happy as well? I think you should be not only the host of the podcast, but the guest too, because you're dead on right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so comparison is, is one of the greatest sources of unhappiness for people that there is because what you, in the age of social media, what you're comparing yourself to is, is somebody else's highlight reel. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm a writer. Listen, here's a good example. I'm a writer. Um, and I do write nonfiction, but my passion is fiction. And, you know, were I to compare myself to Ernest Hemingway, for example, hmm. um, I'm going to lose, man. I mean, for whom the bell tolls, the old man in the sea, the sun all also rises. I mean, come on. And rightfully so, I would lose that comparison. However, Hemingway, by all accounts, by those who, who were close to him and knew him, was could be heartbreakingly cruel. He was a violent misogynist. Um, he was a degenerate alcoholic. Um, so I would be comparing myself to a fraction of another human being's life right. you know those books i mentioned that's his highlight reel exactly and so when you compare yourself you know again it sounds trite but the only person you need to be comparing yourself is you is yourself yesterday and the day before and the day before Absolutely. um because i promise you what you see on social media is a curated collection mm -hmm. right it's not people's real life exactly and and and, and even if it is you know, let's say their life really is that 24, seven, 365, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're everything that, that you think you want to be. But here's the truth of it. As human beings, we are terrifyingly bad at predicting what will make us happy. Um, <laughs> uh, Daniel Gilbert wrote a, a really phenomenal book called Stumbling on Happiness, and he's a Harvard psychologist. And in that book, you know, he said, you know, you hear it all the time, you know, you, you, you know, Jim Carrey in you know recent years has said, look, I wish everybody could rich and be rich and famous so they could figure out that being rich and famous is not what it's all about. Right. And so, you know, when you when you fall into that trap of comparing yourself to others, even if you think they've got everything I want, right? right. Their whole life is a blueprint of what I want. Yeah. Um, the chances are if you went and got it all tomorrow. You'd look around in short order and go, this is not what I thought. We're we're horrifically bad at, at predicting what will make us happy. And, you know, go, going back to the early points in our conversation, the things that make people sustainably happy are service to others, mm -hmm. pursuing things that give their lives meaning, random acts of kindness. Those are the things that always have and always will give people meaning and purpose and value and meaning and purpose and value is what makes people happy. So powerful, man. And I don't know what we can do to just like instill that and just like hammer that in. But I think that's going to be the thing. That's just the biggest takeaway from this is just, if you can, you know, create as much meaning in your life and, per and be more service driven driven and, you know, be focused on what you're becoming rather than what you get. Right. Then I, I think that's, you know, the biggest mindset shift that the listeners can have in, to live a more fulfilling and, and happy life. So yeah, I, I, I think Zig Ziglar said it, um, if I'm not mistaken. And he said, um, he was asked, you know, what's the key to, you know, getting everything you want in your life. And he said, simple, forget about doing that. 
help enough other people get what they want and you'll end up with what you want. Exactly. And and, and that, you know, whether that's business success or material success or happiness, it's the same yeah. for all of them. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to go back to something you said with, um, you know, kind of like we were, what you're saying with Jim Carrey, where, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wish people could get everything they want so they could realize, you know, it's not what makes them actually happy. Um, that, that reminds me, like I've heard of this phrase recently, the hedonic treadmill. And it's yes. like, yeah. So like right when you achieve something and I've noticed this for myself, it's like that becomes the new normal. It's like, that's the new baseline. And then, so it's just like, that's normal now. Like, say you hit a, a certain like revenue goal per month or whatever it is like that you're trying to achieve. It's like, okay, it, it doesn't feel, or like you said with the car, uh, like I, I bought it like a Dodge charger in the past, right, literally right. <laughs> two months later, I was like, this does nothing for me. I'm, I'm not a car guy. I think I just got ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I literally, you, so. You, yeah, the wheel of hedonic adaptation is something I've actually written about extensively um, in a couple of my books. And, um, you know, it's it's a it's an incredibly valuable scenario if you really understand it. And it kind of goes back to what I said about everybody has a happiness set point, okay. right? And you may deviate from that set point because you've got to do this or you've got to that or you've got to that. And the, and the, and the, hedonic, the hedonic treadmill, the wheel of hedonic adaptation, um, it's called both of those things, um, is really fascinating because when you pursue pleasure for the sake of pleasure, so in other words, if you're trying to fill, you know, the unhappiness in your life with stuff, right? Yeah. And by stuff, I don't just mean, I mean, that could be, that could be things that could be sex, that could be, you know, any number of, of, of things. But when you're, when you're trying to take those items that are, that, you know, fire off all the uh, neurotransmitters that, that create um, the illusion of happiness, all the, you right. know, the dopamine and, and all, all these other things. Well, that's when you see, okay, this is very, very transient and temporary. And, and what comes right back to this. Yeah. But there was a really phenomenal study that was done um, and they were trying to find, you know, if you could just do you know, what is the most powerful thing you can do to make yourself happier. And what it really came down to was there was really two. There was living, being present in the moment you're in and random acts of kindness Okay. And as far as simple and the most lasting. And what they found out is they had to completely re-engineer the random act of kindness study because they had a control group and they had a uh, experimental group. The experimental group, they were like, oh, for 30 days, you're going to do three random acts of kindness per day. And the other people are like, don't do anything nice for anybody for the next month. All right. Just do what you normally do. Well, <clears throat> so when they self-reported after this was over, the people who had been performing three random acts of kindness a day their happiness level was just through the roof, right? So then the question became, but is that any different from going out and, you know, closing a big deal or buying a new car or whatever the case may be? So they checked back with them uh, three months and six months later. Okay. They ran into a huge problem with the, with the engineering of the study, which was these people did not quit doing these random acts of kindness. They forgot to tell them, oh, by the way, for the next 90 days, don't do any random acts of kindness. And what they found out is the people, it had so altered their happiness set point that they just didn't stop. Oh, wow. They just kept doing it. And so they, they had to re-engineer it and say, okay, the next time we do this, we're going to tell the the uh, the experimental group, you're going to do this for 30 days, but then you're going to not do it for 30 days. And what they found out is, yeah, there was some drop off in the level of happiness, but they were still like 60% happier than the control group who weren't doing random acts. So it was sustaining over time. Amazing. And they literally had to force them to stop doing this because <laughs> they're like, this works. I wow. love this. Yeah. And I think I saw a similar study to that. And it, it's like, it doesn't even matter how big the act of kindness is right it's like it can be pretty small like the, the like say you gave someone a car compared to you gave someone you know i don't know a card <laughs> that's like that you know there that, there's a similar response that is what i saw i don't know if that's accurate but uh, I, that is completely accurate in okay. fact yeah okay. it is yeah i mean because if it gets too big then people it when an act of kindness is really huge it creates a problem and here's what that is 
it creates it creates an imbalance that people are not comfortable with. Okay. It's like, okay, you did this for me. Now there's an imbalance in our relationship. And now I have to stress and figure out a way to do something for you that recreates the balance. You see? Okay. So to your point, small random acts of kindness, they don't create that imbalance. Yeah. And that's not to say if somebody's in need of something big that you don't do that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is on a day in day out basis, those small random acts of kindness, they create gratitude they don't create imbalance and animosity. Okay. That's, it's interesting. And yeah. I, so I, I finally feel like I've recently gotten to a point where, you know, I'm kind of realizing that and I'm trying to like do more, you know, just no expectations in return, just kind of like more yeah. for other people. So, yeah. but I, I feel like I, for sure, that was a journey for me. And for a long time, it was like, I, I, it's just me, me, me. Like, I don't right. know. I don't have enough to give. Like I, I need to focus right. on me first. Um, yeah, yeah. Like what would your advice be to someone? Cause like, I feel like I could have heard some advice when I was in that point. Like what would be your advice for someone that's feeling like that? Um, I think at a certain stage in people's lives, no matter what you tell them, they're not going to listen. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think you bang your head on that brick. Um, I think it's more of plant the seed because some seeds take a week to germinate and some seeds take months and some seeds take years. So I think what you're really looking for is to plant that seed because when the ground is fertile enough, it'll grow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I think that is somewhat age related, but not always. I know people who are in their seventies who are still some of the most immature SOBs that you'll ever want to meet. Look, getting old does not make you noble. You know, people, as, as young people, we, you know, I know when I was much younger, I had the sense that everybody that was old was, was some, some, you know, super noble person. But the truth of it is there's a lot of just old, old assholes running around. <laughs> <Yeah. Right? laughs> they're yeah. assholes when they're, when they're young, they're assholes when they're old. Right. Um, but I do think as people tend to get older, um, I think that their perspective on advice a lot of times will change. Okay. So I think the easiest way to get through to people rather than saying, Hey man, go do this. It works. Yeah. I think the easiest way to get, to get the point across is to go, Hey, this is where I was. This is where I am now. And this is what I did to get there, but don't take my word for it. Try it. Yeah. Go do random acts of kindness for people for 30 days. And then you come back and you tell me. Right. That. And, and, and I think if you, if they're willing to, to, to take that ride, then you can get through to them. Um, because look, I mean, when, when we're young, you know, nobody can tell us anything. I mean, when I was amazed, you know, the, the distance between 16 and 35, how much more stupid I became. Because I was like, wow, when I was 16, I knew everything. By the time I was 35, I realized I didn't know shit. <laughs> I was like, wow, I got exponentially dumber over them. Um, but I realized what I didn't know and I started listening to a lot more people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, th I think mentors have been the the best unlock for me. Uh, and I, I can't stress it enough. Something I talk about on social media a lot. And it's just, man, I, I just try to keep learning. And I think... You know, a lot of people, they, they feel like they, you know, they get their education, they get their four-year degree and they're done learning, but it's, you know, man, if you can just continue to be a lifelong learner and like how many courses and how easy it is to be, have access to mentors these days, it's, it's crazy. Um, so 40, 47% of high school graduates never read another book after they graduate high school, but here's, oh the, here's what's really trippy. 74% of college grads never read another book. Oh my God. And that's the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. If yep. you're in a fixed mindset, you know what? You're going to spend the rest of your life going like this, trying to trying to find happiness. Happiness wow. is something you do. It is not yep. something you find. It is yep. not a quarter that rolled under the chair that yep. you can go you can go find it. It is a, it is something that you actively do every day. Man, I can't imagine how unhappy I would be if I hadn't read a book or tried to learn something new since high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it really is. Well, kind of, I guess this is kind of related 
do you think doing hard things um, creates an easier life in the long term? That's a great question. Um, not directly, no. Okay. Um, was it John Kennedy said we choose to do things not because they are easy, but because they are hard? And he was talking about the Apollo missions. Um, no, I, I don't think that difficulty in and of itself um, necessarily creates happiness um, or value or meaning. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can do that are difficult. Yeah. I think that looking for things just based on the amount of friction or difficulty involved, um, I think is a fool's errand. Yeah. I think that if you are on track with your unique gifts and your unique purpose, then it's not really hard. Now, that doesn't mean it's not time consuming. Yeah. That doesn't mean it may not take, you know, if you want to write the next great American novel, it might take you a decade, yeah. right? <clears throat> But if writing is your gift, if it's your unique purpose, if it what gives brings meaning and value and happiness to your life, guess what? It's not hard. Right. So, so is, am I making sense here? Yeah, no, so, I, I think that's a really powerful perspective. Yeah, I think because, you know, the outside looking in, people might say, wow, you're working really hard. Um, you know, whatever you're doing, right. If you're writing a yeah, book, it's yeah. like someone right. like saying, Oh my God, why are you grinding so hard to you? It just feels like you're in flow state and you're just like, you know, you're working on your passions and it doesn't even feel like work. So, so I think that's a good perspective for sure. Right. And, and look, I, you know, not everybody is fortunate enough to write out of the gate when they're young to be able to go pursue their passion and make a living. I mean, you know, a lot of us, you know, a lot of people have to pursue things that they're not particularly fond of, but as long as the end game is to move yourself closer to being able to do what you're great at. And people ask me, I get this question all the time. They're like, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my passion is. I don't know how to find it. There's one really quick way to do that. What have people been telling you your whole life that you're great at? Yeah. There's your answer because that is where you're going to shine. That's where your talents are going to lie. And that's where your passions are going to lie. That's where you're going to shine. Go do that. Okay. Because sure. whatever, whatever it is, you're further down the road than, than somebody else, and you can help that person. You Look, you only have to be one chapter ahead. Of, the teacher only needs to be one chapter ahead of the student. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, what what's the best way to kind of cultivate more value? And, you know, say say you you figure out what your purpose is. You know, you, you realize what people have been saying, you know, you're good at. What's the best way to become like the highest value I want to say, man, I mean, most of my listeners are men, but men yeah. or women, like the most valuable person um, you could possibly be like, you know, how do you cultivate as much value as possible? You know, I think that's got some bearing on the the area of, of endeavor, the field of endeavor, the area of expertise. Um, you know, let's take fitness, for example. Um, you know, you have you have a lot of people who are great coaches and mentors in the fitness space. And for those people creating the most amount of value that they can is going to be how many other people can I help with this journey? Right. Because this is what I've done. This is what I've learned. How many more people can I bring along with me? And, right. you know, Physical exercise is one of the hallmarks of staying happy. You know, you got to move, you got to move your ass, right? Get out yeah. there and move, yeah. right? So, you know, it there it has so many massive benefits for people. Uh, the sense of accomplishment, you know, the, it's just it, there's just a whole litany of things. This is your this is your sandbox, right? Right. Um, but by helping other people, <laughs> drag as many people with you as you can. Yeah. Right. Get, you know, just keep getting a bigger and bigger truck and throwing more and more of them in there. Right. right. <laughs> um, because, you know, one of these days you're going to be driving down the road and you're going to look over your shoulder into the, in, into the bed of that huge truck that you've got and you're that massive trailer that you have. And you're going to go, wow, there's a bunch of happy people back there. Yeah. And that's going to be to some extent because, because of, of you as a, as a mentor, as a coach, as a, a writer, a teacher, a podcaster, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, I just don't think there's any faster path to value than going through something challenging, learning, 
and then taking what you've learned and saying, hey, man, you see all those holes in the road? I did a full gainer into every one of them. I'm going to build a bridge over all of them so you don't have to do that. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, I've noticed it 100%. It's like, you know, there's no better feeling than when you share your passion and teach someone how to do the things that you did. Um, so I think everyone's got something that they can share from their own experiences. But I feel like a lot of people, um, they don't think they have, you know, enough to to provide. So what what can they do to to cultivate that? And what, you know, maybe maybe it's imposter syndrome, maybe it's, you know, lack of of confidence in general. I don't know, but what, what can people do if they're feeling like that, where they don't think they have enough to provide for others? Those are what you just mentioned are the two biggest obstacles, imposter syndrome and feeling like they're not an expert. Okay. Um, <clears throat> back to, it, it goes back to what I said. You only have to be one chapter ahead of the student in order to help. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so rather than put a label on it, like we talked about, Oh, I I'm an imposter. Well, Okay. Have you read chapter 37? Yes. Has he? No. <laughs> Do you now know something he does it? Yes. Can you share that with him? Okay. Yes. You are not an imposter. Yeah. Do you have enough, enough expertise? Exact same scenario. Yeah. Have you developed a really killer chest routine? Yes. Is he struggling with, with, with his pecs? Yes. Do yeah. you know how to help him with that? Yes. You to him are an expert. So you take the labels off of it. You take imposter and you take, you know, non-expert and you throw those in the, in the trash bin on, yeah. the, on the, the trash heap and you just go help. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? And, and the, the quickest cure for those two things is to just go help and see the result. Yeah. You know, when that guy says to you, Hey man, you know what? A chest is rocking. Thank you. Then imposter and expert, you know, BS all goes out the window anyway. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I think it it kind of piggybacks off of what you said earlier and it kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, maybe if you're feeling like that, then start giving out some, some free value. That can be your form of, um, of acts of kindness is, you know, giving out free value, see what kind of feedback you get in return. And that might motivate you and, and give you the confidence to, to start maybe charging for your services and stuff like that. Look, when it comes to business, give away 99% of your best stuff. Yeah. It's totally antithetical to what anybody who does business doesn't know about what the internet business on the internet is about. Give away right. your best stuff, you know, charge, charge, give away 99 charge for the one. That's it. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah, it's because it's the implementation and the execution and, and the packaging, right? It's like getting it, that, that's what people are really paying for when they're, when they're like working with you one-on-one, -on -one, right? So. Yeah, they're paying for the accountability. They're paying for, you know, well, here's what they're paying for. You can give them all of the information that you have for free. You, as a matter of fact, you should give yeah. it all to them because what, that's not what they're paying for, is it? What they are paying for is access to you. Yeah. That's what they're paying for. Yeah. And then they have more access to, to kind of download your mindset when there's that, that one-on-one -on -one interaction and everything. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That's all they're paying for. I mean, they can get, look, they can get the information on the internet. There's yeah. nothing out there. You can go learn to, you can download the plans to build a friggin' <laughs> bomb on the internet, right? There's nothing they can't get. They yeah. want you, they want you to curate it for them. Yeah. Like put a bow on it, put it in a box, put a bow on it and go, boom, here it is. Do that. For free. Yeah. But then if they want to pay for access to you, then let them pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, yeah. What if someone um, works like a regular nine to five and, sure. you, know, you know, how can they provide more value and, and feel like they're living more meaning in their life and, and have purpose? You know, do you think everyone should have a side hustle where they, they provide experience and coaching to others in, in different areas? Or do you think there's a way um, for someone just working a regular nine to five or corporate job um, to do all these things that we're talking about? No, I don't think everyone should have a side hustle. I okay. don't think some people are cut from that cloth. Okay. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, you can have a side hustle that doesn't involve the things that you and I've just been talking about. Okay. So your side hustle does not have to be 
revenue generating. It can be value only generating. It can be yep. meaning only generating. So if you're working a nine to five and you dig your nine to five and your nine to five is doing something that doesn't necessarily bring a lot of value to the world, that's okay. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yep. But there are a million things, an infinite endless list of things that you can do to make the world a better place. Place Go join um, Big Brothers. Go volunteer at the at the local shelter. Yeah. Go, you know, I, I live in, in New Orleans. Go down to the coast and plant some some vegetation so our coast quits disappearing on the weekends. I mean, there is <laughs> there's an I mean, go to the uh you know, I'm a musician. They, there's nothing better to me than going to the retirement home and and playing music for those people. I, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And those things will not only add value to other people, but they will make you a heck of a lot happier. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah so that, that's, guys, the easiest pathway, just, to, you know. It's simple. Yeah, it's simple. Just random acts of kindness, you know, provide value by and meaning by doing meaningful acts of kindness. So right. it's awesome. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I hear people all the time, you know, they see people in distress and so on and so forth. And, you know, they're like, hey, well, I'm sending you thoughts and prayers. I'm like, that's great. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. But what I really could use is a sandwich. <laughs> right yeah. yeah 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 do something your time you, you know get off your ass and do something <laughs> for sure yeah um i want to go back to because you, you mentioned dopamine real briefly in one of yeah. one of your answers you were saying um what you know so dopamine is something i've looked into a little right. bit and you know what i've what i've found in my own life is Okay, this is super interesting. This this may be off topic from from what you usually talk about. I don't know, um, but I've actually used like caffeine to anchor in hard things that I know are going to help me move forward. Um, you know, working working out, um, like mm -hmm. doing creative tasks. I use caffeine as like um, a reward system, basically. Sure. I've, yeah. I've seen science on this where it like mm -hmm. increases your dopamine. You know, mm -hmm. it helps like kind of reward you for doing those tasks. Um, so that's, that's one area of dopamine that I've looked into. And then also just looking at, you know, pleasure dopamine with like, you know, TikTok, um, you know, Netflix, even going out to like nightclubs, just, you know, things that you, you get really easy hits of dopamine can mm -hmm. lower your, your kind of like baseline of dopamine and make it harder for you to, to get dopamine from actually completing tasks like that I was just mentioning from like work, working out and things yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. What's kind of just your take and what's the science behind all that? Sure. sure. Um, my take is dopamine as a neurotransmitter is grossly misunderstood. Okay. Um, dopamine occurs in its highest doses in your bloodstream from the anticipation, not from the completion. Uh, That's how it works. So, um, people can here's an example people can can watch a movie and and go you know let's let's say somebody should watch me and says, oh that wasn't all that good well if you could have done better in your own head then why are you watching the movie right <laughs> dopamine <clears throat> is it the anticipation of the vacation often as good if not better than the vacation yeah right is it the anticipation of of the date or the 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 workout or whatever it may be often just as good yeah. so people have a tendency to this i'm not suggesting that dopamine is not released um you know mid journey mid task or upon completion certainly that it is but um <clears throat> i'll give you a let, let's talk about let's talk about social media as a, as a prime example of this some of the highest paid psychologists on the planet um there's really kind of two um Ones that work for, for example, hedge funds on Wall Street, and their job is to keep um, the traders in peak flow state at all times. Those, those guys make millions. The other set are the guys who you you like to think it's you know people who are helping children who are raised yeah. in broken homes by monsters, but unfortunately, yeah. that doesn't pay as nearly as well. The other ones are people who engineer addiction into into video games and social platforms. Hmm. So high psychologists are hired specifically to engineer addiction into those platforms. So what keeps people 
buried in their phones, going back, going back, going back, going back, going back. Is that the dopamine hit from seeing the like, or is it the dopamine they they get when they can't wait to go get their hands on their phone and see how many likes that post got? The the latter. That, that's where the addiction truly happens. Yeah. That because that's where the big dopamine hit is going on. Yeah. So look, dopamine is a great thing, um, and it can be used, you know in a very positive way, but can also be hideously destructive. Um, and it goes back to, to the whole pleasure seeking thing. Right. Yeah. So um, how can people use it the best way possible? Once you start engaging in activities that bring you lasting, sustained happiness as a function of meaning and value, then you will start anticipating being able to do those things again. It's just like the people I told you were in the study and they wouldn't stop doing it. Yeah. Why? The reason they won't stop doing it is because the anticipation of I'm going to get to help some other random stranger today. This is going to be awesome. Okay. Right. That's how you how harness the power of dopamine. Um, you don't harness it through things that are, that are hollow and meaningless pursuits because look, addiction can be a good thing if you're, if you're addicted to things that are look you yeah. always want to have choices i mean i you know i gotta be careful here you know happiness is about having choices right yeah. so you don't ever want to be an automaton you don't want to be on autopilot you want to be able to choose right. you want to be able to choose even if today hey i'm not going to do a random act of kindness for anybody today i'm going to sit on the couch and eat bonbons and wallow in my misery <laughs> okay great yeah. but um getting yourself to where you are using the neurotransmitter in a positive way mm -hmm. um, will serve you for life. If you're using it in a negative way, it won't. And, you know, yeah. you know, to, in this day and age, you know, you see people, you know, you see four people sitting at a table. They're obviously all friends and none of them are speaking to each other because they're in their phones. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, the worst punishment in, in the world today for, for a kid is to take their phone away from them. I mean, they're, they're like, beat me. I'll take the beating. Just don't take my phone. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and it's because of the dopamine hits that are engineered into the anticipation of those platforms by you know, my constituents, psychologists. <laughs> gotcha. Um, yeah, I, 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 what I'm really resonating with with what you're saying is, you know, I feel like the we can kind of create positive addictions in a way, you know, you with, with with helping people with providing meaning, and that's something that I was kind of getting at with. With like, I, I literally try to time my caffeine to give myself like reward for like work and helping people and, you know, serving my clients and everything. It's almost yeah. like I'm trying to brainwash myself. In, <laughs> in, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Do right. you think, do you think that that's an unhealthy thing that I'm doing? Or do you think that in the long run, um, if I can kind of like change my mindset to program myself um, to enjoy, you know, the hard tasks of of like helping people as opposed to, you know, the, the dopamine anticipation tasks that'll give me maybe a, a quick pleasure, but it's not going to give me that long-term um, fulfillment and meaning. Do you think that the, I'm on the right path with this? Or do you think this is, um, is, there could be a different approach to what I'm doing? I think you just answered your own question. <laughs> um, look, I'm not trying to be artfully vague here. Um, does the caffeine reward system work for you? I think that's the larger question. Yeah, it does. It's I I feel like I've been able to basically program my mind to do the things that I know are maybe a little bit tougher in the moment, but give me the the long lasting um, happiness and fulfillment that I'm looking for. Then so, I would keep doing it. Okay. Now, here's what's going to happen. Keep doing that if it's working for you. And it's look. Here's the question. The question is, the question is, is it useful? That's the ultimate question, right? So if it's useful for you at this stage, you should keep doing that. But here's what's going to happen. As you progress down the road to your goal, as you get closer and closer, yep. what's going to happen is, is the more, the more value you add, the more people you help, yeah. the caffeine's going to matter less and less Yeah, because you're going to see the result, not only in the people that you're helping, but you're going to feel it in your own life. Right. Right. And so rather than go, oh, I got to stop doing this and do something. This is bad. That's good. Forget the labels. 
Yeah. If the caffeine reward system is working for you now, then keep doing that. Yeah. And it will naturally evolve into something a lot more holistic. Um, it just will. And, it, and that is inevitable. Right. One of these days you're, you'll look back without even being aware of it. You'll look back and go, I remember when I used to have to bribe myself with caffeine to do this. <laughs> I know. That they will, that they will come. And I think I, you know, I've definitely seen it. I think whenever I'm kind of going into new ventures or I'm like trying to go up a level on what yeah. I'm doing, I, I, I go back to that. I think I do have an addictive personality and it's like, <laughs> I've, I've kind of used that to get myself to go to the next level. And then yeah. I, and then I kind of get to a point where it levels out <clears throat> and yeah, I don't need that to, to push me. And it's just, I'm getting the, the dopamine and the, the chemical responses from the actual acts and it's, it kind of levels out. Um, but I yeah. think it, I think it can be a, pretty powerful tool um for for maybe like pushing yourself to get started with those things most of the best athletes i know are ex addicts <laughs> I mean, literally i mean i'm not saying they're you know they were like you know skid ropes smack junkies but yep. they were addicts in one way or another but most of the best ones that i know you know and looked up one day and said okay i you know i'm i need to get myself addicted to something different but at the end of the day they just love adrenaline yeah you know it would make somebody strap on a wingsuit and go fly through a hole in a mountain Right. And, and, they, and, I, and I think it's finding your, like your obsession, like, you know, cause you could obsess over something that's healthy or unhealthy. Right. And it's yeah, like, yeah. You know, I think you can become super obsessed in finding your meeting, your purpose and, you know, going all in on that. And, you know, even if you become obsessed and from the outside world of like people are like, you're, you're going too hard at what you're doing. It's like, well, this is long-term going to lead to a lot of positivity. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this is yeah. maybe just a period where you got to grind through it and it, yeah. you're, out on the other side being a lot yeah look here's what i think is, is, is super important to realize and, and that is when you set a goal for yourself first of all write it down 73 uh, percent people who write their goals down are 73 percent more likely to achieve them this is by the simple act of putting it on paper i mean there's a lot of under, under the hood of that but okay uh that's a hard that was a 35 year harvard study uh, um now here's what else is important to know you set some long-term, you know, big goal for yourself, yeah. right? You need to be completely cognizant of and at peace with when you achieve that, the chances are it's not going to be exactly what you thought. Right. And the human condition is as follows. Set a goal, work your ass off achieve that goal, look around and be happy for a few minutes and then go, okay, what's next? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That elemental truth about the human condition does not change yeah. ever. That is immutable. It's one of the few things about human the human condition that is immutable, but that is immutable. You go back to what I mentioned, Dan Gilbert's book, Stumbling on Happiness. You know, he said, look, you know, you said that he said, but you still have to set the goals and you still still need to go achieve it because that's where you bring meaning and value to yourself and, and those around you. So yeah. so the one of the greatest things that I can share with people about happiness is this. Divorce yourself from the outcome of your actions. And that sounds so counterintuitive. I know that it does. Yeah. But if you're doing the action, if you're taking the action for the right reasons, right, that's enough. Yeah. Because the outcome is never going to be the state that you think it is anyway. Right. So do these things because they need to be done, not because of you know, it's like, can I say an example for me? Yes, please. Yeah. So it's kind of crazy because I feel like I almost lost my passion. You know, I don't think I fully did because I stayed working out consistently. I've right. never really stopped, right. but like, I feel like I almost lost my passion um, for my own fitness a while back. And then when I started thinking about it, like, you know, I'm inspiring my, my clients, everyone that's following my journey when it became more about that. Like now, a lot of times I go into workout, if I don't feel motivated, I'm like, I'm literally, this is my job. I'm inspiring others. I'm trying to lead by example. And that has made my passion like reignite. And it's made it so that I have like 
unending motivation. I can always just kind of remind myself of that whenever, right. it's, you know, it's about them now. It's not about me. So I yeah. think that, that kind of relates to what you're saying where it's, you know, it's not about the outcome. It's about like what, what that you're doing, what is that providing value to others for? Like what, what kind of right. meaning is behind this? Right. Yeah. If your if your pursuit is to add meaning and value to those, to, to those around you and yourself, um, then the outcome becomes less and less relevant. Yeah. Right. And, and and again, I know that sounds twisted and 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 strange, yeah. but if you peel the onion far enough back, then the adding the meaning and the value becomes its own reward. Yeah. You always want to stay away from carrot and stick behaviors. Yeah. Whether those are applied to someone else or to yourself. 100 percent Yeah. And I think, you know, maybe you're not a fitness coach. You don't have a bunch of clients looking up to your journey, but you know, one thing I've said in the past is like, I'm sure there's a couple people in your life that look at you as, as an example or role model. So just think about them and then, you know, think about the things that you're doing in life um, and trying to lead by example. <laughs> that's going to, that's a powerful motivator that I've found as well. That's a fact. Yes, yeah. indeed. Awesome. Yes, indeed. Man, Ed, I feel like I could talk to you all day, man. This, this <laughs> it's been, been great, awesome. man. It's been really great. I've enjoyed the heck out of it. This is so cool. Um, well, you know, one final question, then I'll kind of like sure. wrap it up. Um, yeah. What would you like to challenge the listeners? You know, this is the Elevate Everyday Podcast. We're all about, you know, get 1% better every day. But yep. listeners, like you got to take action immediately. You know, it's mm-hmm. not just about listening. It's about putting this stuff into practice right away. Yep. So yep. what would you like to challenge the listeners to take action on after listening to this? Sure. Um, it's something we've talked about already extensively. Um, I, I think my first, my first, the first thing I'd like to, to say about that is <laughs> there are those who talk and there are those who do, and they do not resemble one another. Hmm. No amount of plan in the world is ever going to generate results unless you take not only massive action, but massive inspired action. And those two things don't resemble each other either. Right. Um, that said, um, look, man, I, I would, I would go with, with, uh, what we talked about, you know, 30 days of random acts of kindness. Girl. I, I think if there's one thing that your listeners can do that will 30 days later, make them go, Holy what is it that easy? Yeah. <laughs> um, and they'll end up being just like the people in the study. It just won't stop. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I shared the story with you. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. When we talked earlier, um, I was in a, uh, I was in a Burger King drive through before all your listeners go, oh my God, what are you doing a Burger King? Um, uh, I don't eat meat. And they have the impossible Whopper. So, oh. <laughs> so, so there I was. Um, and I'm with, I'm with my bride and, um, we were in the drive through for five minutes and then 10 minutes and then 20 and then 25. And, and, you know, people in the cars in front of me are pulling out of line and, you know, screaming and cursing and, and the couple of people in front of me did manage to wait it out. And, and, you know, when they got to the window, I heard them, you know, just berating this young lady at the window, just, you know, cursing her and, you know, just being horrific. And my wife's like, do you really want, you know, we've been here almost half an hour. Are you really? And I'm like, well, we've got half an hour in. <laughs> we might as well stick around. But the truth of it is where we were, there's really just nowhere else available where I could that would have had anything that I could have eaten. So or that right. I would have chosen to eat at least. So uh, I said, yeah, man, we're going to stick this out. So we got up to the window and I mean, she is so harried and just, you know, and I said, in the weeds a little. She's like, uh, she said, she's I'm the only person here. Corporate would not let me close. She said, I, nobody showed up for work. Literally the whole staff did show up for work. I don't know why. And she said, so I am taking the orders. I am cooking the food. I am bagging the food. I am working the cash register and I'm working the drive through intercom. And I'm like, Jeez. wow. So um, I said, well, look, I said, you don't have to worry about me. I'm good. We're good. Take your time. And she was so, so grateful. And when she gave us our food, I gave her a really significant tip. And she's like, no, 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 you gave me way. She's like, what is this? Way too much money. I said, no, it's not. No, no, that, you know, that's your tip. That's for you. And she just, just exploded into tears. And she's wow. like, you have no idea. She said, because she said, I have three kids and we're really, really struggling. And she said, this month, we didn't even know if we we're going to be able to make the rent. I cannot even 
possibly tell you what this means. Yeah. And I'm like, look, I just, I just deeply appreciate you, you know, sticking it out, staying the course, doing your job, you know, and, and I get you're doing what you have to do. And, and I said, and I am deeply sorry for all those jackasses in front of me who were screaming and cursing at you. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, it's that kind of thing um, that, you know, that's been a year and a half ago. I still feel good about that Yeah. to this day and probably always will. I'll probably yeah. never forget that. It, and, you know, random acts of kindness, this is another interesting thing about it. You never forget them. Yeah. So <clears throat> when I say this, people all go, what? No way. You forget over 95% of your life. And if you don't think that is true, Think about what you remember on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, over the last year of your life. Go back and write down everything you can remember over the last year of your life and figure out time-wise how much that represents of how many minutes are in the last year. And you will find out that 95% of your life is gone, yeah. right? The stuff that sticks is highly emotionally charged and helping people is stickier than anything else that you can do. So you want to remember a bunch more of your life, go help a bunch more people. Man, I, I'm so inspired right now. <laughs> I can't wait to go do random acts of kindness. I hope, yep. hope the listeners are inspired too when you're listening to this. Man. You know, and look, it have to be a big thing. You know, just smiling at a passing stranger, something as simple as that. Go, well, go, go do it in New York. You might run into some trouble, but <laughs> no, but seriously, go smile at a passing stranger. Hold the door open for somebody, you know, say please and thank you. Pay for the guy's, you know, coffee next to you at Starbucks or pay for the person in the, behind you in line at the at the drive through I mean, there's just a million things you can do. Go, awesome. go to the retirement home and just sit down and just sit down and introduce yourself to people and visit with them because they're lonely and have nobody to talk to. I mean, that yeah. the list is endless, yeah. but these things you will never, ever forget. Man, Ed, thank you for doing the random act of kindness of gracing us with your pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. Man, there, there's so much value you guys take. Take what you're hearing, put it into action. Um, thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. Absolutely. Guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, listeners, guys, expert podcast, or sorry, experts on the podcast every week. Um, make sure to smash the like button, smash the subscribe button. Stay tuned for guys like Ed just providing value to you guys. Um, but put this stuff in action right away. Okay. So I'll see you guys in the next video. And in the meantime, elevate every day. Thank you.